Hi guys and welcome to this home theater video. If you're watching, you probably are thinking about having a home theater installed. You may already have a home theater, or you might be just like me and are addicted to watching other people's home theater videos on YouTube. Whatever the case may be, I wanted to share with you all what I've learned along the process of having and building a home theater. Now, by no means am I an expert on home theaters, but I wanted to share the things that I've learned while doing this, this project. All right, so let's get started. So a home theater can be a multi-purpose room. You can use it for watching movies, gaming, music, meditation, reading, and just relaxing. Now from what I've gathered, there are two main types of home theater. There's a dedicated home theater in which a room of your home is solely dedicated for this purpose. Now these rooms will have a nice big screen, uh, comfortable seating, surround sound, it encompasses the movie experience. Now the multi-purpose home theater is typically in a shared space. It has to blend in with a living room, maybe a man cave, or maybe even an exercise room. Location. Where in your home you decide to put the, the theater is important because it will affect the core elements of a home theater, which include soundproofing, light control, aesthetics, access, speaker placement, and seating. Now, if done correctly, the integration of your home theater can increase the value of your home. That being said, here is a picture of a typical home, plus or minus the garage and the basement, so that we can begin to discuss the pluses and minuses of having a home theater in different spaces. Now, I've made a list here of the different areas where we can have a home theater from most ideal to least ideal. The most ideal here is the detached room. This would require you to have the space and the money to build a detached room away from your home where you can build and have complete control of the space, the size, the insulation, the electrical, everything having to do with the home theater. However, that again requires to have a lot of money to be able to make this happen and the space. The next most ideal spot is the basement. Now the basement is an area that's already insulated on five of the walls except the ceiling and so sound is most likely to leak up into the areas above the basement. Now this would require you to soundproof the ceiling of the basement and that would make the basement an ideal space to be able to watch movies as loud as you want without intruding. Next would be a dedicated room within your home. Now this could be a bedroom, an attic, any space like this. The main key to consider with a dedicated room would be soundproofing the rooms. Even the most economic of surround systems will produce enough noise that you need to consider the sound leaking into adjacent spaces. The other thing to consider in a dedicated room is the windows. So you will need to be able to control the light, either buying curtains that block the sun or dimming lights so that you can control the lighting from your seating while watching the movie. Next on the list is kind of a group, the shared room and the part of a man cave. These are all shared rooms. Now the main things to consider with these is how to blend the wiring, the speakers, so that the home theater experience is as best as possible without overtaking the room. This is probably the trickiest of all because you are sharing that space. So sometimes you will just want to watch TV and you don't want that home theater experience all around you. Now the other thing is this is a very public space so that anybody walking by can see what you're watching and it's just less private. However, we need to make do with what we have and if this is a situation that you're, you're in, then make the best of the living shared space. The garage is a very, very tricky place to have a home theater. It would have to be the right garage, the right conditions. Now if you have a detached garage that you use frequently, this might not be an option for you. But if you have a garage full of junk and full of stuff, you may consider having a yard sale and using the profits of the yard sale to go back into the garage and give it some insulation, give it a new paint job, give it a projector, give it whatever it needs so that you can turn the garage into a theater experience. If done correctly, the garage can also be a multi-purpose uh, type of room. The outdoor theater. 
Now this type of theater I've seen done really well at the sides of swimming pools or by a hot tub. However, the use of this theater is very limited because you would only be able to use it at night when it's really dark outside and you're able to get a good picture. Now the other place that I've seen this done is um, by the beach. You inflate a screen and you project an image onto that and you have small speakers. So you're mostly worried about just having an experience but not necessarily having a quality of sound, a quality of picture. It's just about being outside and having fun. So from the detached room to the outdoors room, I hope that this thought process helps you think about where your theater might be the best, where you're going to get the best experience if it's in the basement, in the attic, in the garage, in the living room. We're all working under different budgets, different spaces, different restrictions, but there's no reason why you can't maximize the space that you have if this is what you're looking for. In this next segment, I want to talk to you guys about the components that are required to run a home theater. Now, imagine the right side of the screen is the front of the room. So I have a drop-down screen, and then I listed here a television, although I don't have one in my theater room, just so you guys get the idea. Now, in the back of the room on the left, I have a Sony projector. And on the bottom here, you see the V35 Bose home theater speakers, those are the ones I have. Now in the center of the room I group these together because these are the components that really produce the media. I have a Blu-ray player, I have an Apple TV, the Wii, the PS3. Underneath these I have a power regulator that helps regulate the power so that everybody, all the components get really clean power and it protects them in case there's a, some kind of an electrical circuit short now also at the very end here important is acoustic treatment now if you guys are really serious about having a really good theater experience uh, you have to consider the acoustic treatment as another component it's equally as important so in this schematic the red lines represent electric power going to your components so if you see right next to the power regulator there's an outlet so the power regulator connects to the outlet and everything else connects to the power regulator. This way the power regulator cleans up the electrical power going to the devices and protects them in case there's some kind of electrical malfunction. Uh, in this next schematic these are the, con the connections between the different components. For example in the center you see the blue line all those components run down and connect to the the Bose system. Now this would be the receiver that most people would have so that those components go to the Bose and the Bose then directs the signal out to the projector and out to the TV if you have one. So overall, I hope that gives you an idea of all the wires that are required and that you will need to conceal or deal with when you're building a home theater system. Now, I didn't talk about all the wires required for the speakers because they're in that element with the Bose, but those are also wire components that need to, you need to address the, the wires, hiding the wires, uh, running them through the wall, or concealing them in some way. Additional components, these are things that you can consider buying for your home theater. Blackout blinds or curtains are definitely things that you're going to need in order to control the light environment in the room. A universal remote will definitely make your life easier so you're not juggling all the different remotes for all the different components while you're trying to watch a movie. Receiver for the PS3, this might be a mute point with the PS4, but in order for your remote to communicate with the PS3, you will need to get this adapter. Now this, the hidden IR repeater, this is important only when you're placing your components in a hidden area in a different room, for example in a cabinet. If you're putting your components in a cabinet, you will need a way for your remote to reach those components. And so a hidden IR repeater takes a signal from a sensor that's sitting in the room, a direct line of sight to your remote, and it takes that signal into the cabinet for your components. And along those lines, if your components are hidden in a closed cabinet, then you will need to consider ventilating that cabinet because the components, if you let them run, run in a closed space, they can overheat and then that component will be damaged and you will need to replace it. So it's much cheaper to think of this ahead of time that you will need to ventilate the space where your components are located if it is in a closed space like a cabinet. Next is hanging the projector. If you're putting the projector on top of something like a shelf, that's fine, 
but you can also hang it from a ceiling and this is the one I used. Now also the 3D glasses, a lot of projectors now are doing 3D and they come with one or two pairs of glasses so if you have a large family or are planning to invite a lot of people over for a 3D movie you will need to consider purchasing additional glasses. Now this, the butt kickers, now this is an item that you requires power so you'll need to connect it to an electrical source and part of it uh, goes under one of the legs of your couch. What it's meant to do is it syncs to the sound of the movie so that when the movie has a strong scene with vibrations, it'll vibrate your couch so you feel the vibrations stronger in the couch where you're sitting. The Darby, this is an item, the Darby V DVP 500. Now this is advertised to maximize the image quality of your projector to the screen to make it resemble a 4K. However, I got this item and I returned it because I didn't feel that it did um, a really good job in, in, in maximizing the quality of my image. Now, it could be that my projector is so good that I didn't see a big difference, but a lot of people do find that they see a big difference with this Darby. So, it'll be an expense if you want to have it to maximize your image quality. The last thing I didn't include in here is bulbs. Now with a projector you will need to consider replacing that bulb because it will eventually die out. The bulbs only have so many hours of life and after that you will need to replace them. And the bulbs can be quite expensive, a couple hundred dollars. So here you have it guys. This is a list of all the components, additional components that might make your life easier and sometimes might be required like the vents in order to make your home theater experience uh, run smooth. Now before you go out and buy the biggest screen that you can fit on your wall, consider that there are three basic sizes of screens. So when a director films a movie, they shoot it in different sizes depending on what their vision, what their view of the, of the story is. So if a director shoots a movie in a ratio of 2.35 to 1, and you have a screen of this aspect ratio, 2.35 to 1, then your, the movie will fill the entire screen. Here is a shot of a movie Skyfall that was shot in this aspect ratio, filling the entire screen. Now the next common aspect ratio is 16 by 9, which is very, very popular. A lot of high definition screens, TV screens, have this aspect ratio, and so a lot of movies are shot to fit this type of screen. So if you have the type of screen of 16 by 9 and you have a movie shot in that aspect ratio it will fill up the entire screen. Now here's a sample shot of the movie Up that was shot in this aspect ratio and it's fitting the entire screen. Now the last aspect ratio is 4 by 3. Now this is still a remnant from when TVs were very square and so movies were shot to fit that profile, that 4 by 3. And so this type of screen is still lingering out there but it's a rare breed and so here's a shot from an old Mexican movie that fills up this screen. So what does this mean? This means that if you're watching Skyfall in the same aspect ratio screen, it's going to fill it up. But then if you watch it into a 16 by 9 screen, you will need to shrink Skyfall, the actual movies, to make it fit into the 16 by 9. And this is how you end up with black bars at the top and bottom. Conversely, if you are watching a 16 by 9 a movie, in that same format screen, it'll fit the entire screen. But then if you project it onto a 2.35 to 1 screen ratio, you will have black bars on the sides. This is simply a matter of choice. So there are three elements in a home theater that will help you figure out how far back to put your projector and how big of a screen you can buy. So there are three numbers you need in order to figure this out. The throw ratio comes with a projector and so you'll just need to read the stats on the projector you have or the projector you want to buy. The distance, D, is from the lens of the projector to the screen and W is the diagonal length of the screen from corner to corner. Now having any two of these numbers will help you figure out the other. Once again, the throw ratio is native to the projector. D is the distance from the lens to the screen, W screen corner to corner. Here is a formula solved in three different ways, so depending on what you're looking for, you can use the right formula. Let's give this a try. My projector is a Sony 95ES. There's a throw ratio for my projector. The distance I'm working with is about 18 feet, 
and the diagonal. That's what I'm trying to find out. How big of a screen can I buy for this room? I'm going to use the formula W equals D over TR. The maximum W, if I plug it into the formula, maximum is 12 feet in diagonal of my screen. Minimum is about 8.5 feet. And there you have it, guys. And now it's just a matter of choosing a CinemaScope screen, 2.35 to 1, or a 16 by 9, and that's just all personal preference. Design and style. Now, here's a segment I want to just go through so a couple of home theater videos I pulled off the internet and think about them. This setup is one of my favorites. It's very elegant. It looks open. You can see that they have a 16 by 9 screen. There's enough room there to feel like you have a sense of space and to give that screen enough room to just overtake that, that space. You can see that maybe this is a multi-purpose room. On the left, there's a little piano table. There's a rack on the, on the back, and there's some curtains over here. So I think the acoustics in this room would be really good. The rug, I can see there's a rug there. There's curtains. I think this is a really well-designed room, and it's maximizing the space that we see here. The other thing is, this is such a big 16 by nine screen. I think if you play a 2.35 to one movie on this screen, it's still going to be a good picture, a good size picture. This setup is also uh, very nicely done. You can see that there is a TV mounted on the wall. All the components are displayed under the TV in a very well-organized rack. There's some cabling going on there, so that's fine. You can see the speakers on either side. This is probably a 5.1 uh, a sound system, I'm not sure, but from what I can see, it looks very well-organized, very clean. Uh, hardwood floors, I would imagine, maybe a little bit of echo, but I don't know what the rest of this room looks like. Overall, very well done, and I think this, this home theater system doesn't overtake the room, and it seems to fit this space. Now, this system looks pretty cool. All the components are the same color. There's good organization, good layout. The TV, however, it's kind of one of those old TVs, kind of big. The speakers, however, I would be a little nervous to sit in front of these speakers. I'm not sure what, how, how much control you can have with these ginormous speakers. Maybe the speakers, the sound system here overtakes the image. I think if the television was maybe bigger, balancing out the possible sound that can come out of these speakers. Overall, really well done. Very well organized. Color matching. Components well organized. I don't see much cabling, a little bit behind the speakers, but when the room is dark, you're watching TV, things are good. This setup, you can tell this person is just doing throw down. They're putting a sheet for a screen. They have a projector on a table. There's some exposed cables there on the computer organized on the left. It's in the bedroom. You can see there's a ceiling fan, some pictures on the wall. So this is just somebody who loves to watch movies and it doesn't even matter. This picture, I love it. It reminds me what it's really about. It's just about having an experience where you're maximizing your elements, your setup, your budget to really make do with what you have. You know, we've seen setups that people spend thousands and thousands of dollars. And this is a setup for true enjoyment. Just doesn't matter. Just get the picture up there, put up the sheet and kick back and watch a, a movie on a bigger screen. This setup is really well balanced, I think, because it does a good job in balancing what looks to be a living room that's highly functional. You see a bunch of seating areas. There's windows there on the left that you can probably just close the blinds and have a good experience. There's a four by three aspect ratio screen hanging from the ceiling. And if I think this correctly, you can probably elevate that screen, get it out of the way, and there's probably a TV back there, I would imagine. Now remember, with a TV and a, and a drop-down screen, the issues with that is lighting. It looks like there's a lot of lighting here, and even with the level of light that we have coming into this room right now, you see an okay picture on the screen. I would imagine in this setup, during the day, they probably use the television that might be behind the screen because of light. The TV is going to give you a good image. And at night, when everything gets dark, you probably turn on the projector, drop the screen, and have a theater experience right there in your living room. So overall, really well done. The speakers look to be uh, very well placed, uh, good size. You're probably going to get good sound from these speakers uh, matching the size of the image that you have. This setup is very clean, very elegant. 
I love the color balance. I like how they put the components underneath the TV in a closed space. Now I'm not sure if that's glass or if that's mesh that we can see through. If it were glass, we probably need to ventilate. Maybe there's no back <clears throat> to that lower cabinet, so that helps ventilate the components. The colors, I like how the black is all matching, the TV, the couch, the speakers, the walls. Now, I agree here that they, the TV does well because of the lighting. You can see there's those huge doors right there letting in a lot of light. So I can imagine at night, maybe a projector can come down from the ceiling, but during the day, this is definitely the way to go with a television. Now the speakers, if I was sitting in that couch, I almost feel like I'm under a microscope with all those different speakers. I would be a little nervous how much sound is concentrated in this space. But it looks like they're thinking about the quality of sound with the panels behind the TV. So overall, very clean setup. They're maximizing what they have. This person might be listening to a lot of audio in this, enjoying music. You can see there's some drums, a guitar back there. So there's definitely a purpose for this room and it looks like they're maximizing their space. In this segment, I want to focus a little bit on the extra things you might want to purchase for your theater. Just to give you that extra luxury sensation that things that you you will over time probably buy because you get caught up in the movie environment, the theme of what you're trying to build. For example, a very comfortable couch. There could be couches that are meant to recline. Some of them have cup holders. Some of them vibrate. They recline. The sky is the limit. However, you just want to be comfortable. Make sure when the lights are off, nobody's going to see what you're sitting on. You're, you're going to be focused on the experience going on in front of you. So uh, seating is another issue that you're going to run into an expense, perhaps, depending on what your setup looks like. The other thing is a beverage center. Beverage centers are going to help to keep drinks in the area where you have your theater. Now, if this is an area where there are no other refrigerators close by, this might be something you want to invest in to have a cold beverage handy while you're watching the movie. Now, popcorn, a lot of people choose to buy a popcorn maker, or like me, I choose to buy popcorn already made in a bag ready to eat. You may want that smell of fresh popcorn, now, if you have enough space where you can have the, the popcorn machine located, that might be good. Maybe an adjacent room that you're using as your lobby before you enter the theater might be a good place to put the popcorn because think about the smell is going to overtake that space. Um, so that's an option. Another thing you might consider having in your theater. The next thing is uh, some kind of blanket. Here's a lady with a Snuggie. So this is just things, extra things that are going to come up where you're snuggling, you're watching a movie, and you just want to cover up and feel cozy. Other stuff you may consider is decorating your theater. A lot of people use movie posters, and I know on Craigslist here where I live, you can find a lot of movie posters uh, that are framed, that are not framed, different sizes, or you can order them online, I'm sure. But it's going to be another thing you need to consider if you want to go above and beyond and make your home theater have a little more of a theater feel. I personally don't have any posters in my theater, but it fits with what I'm trying to do. And so I choose to pass on the movie posters, uh, but it, it fits what I have. The next thing you want to consider, if your room is in a basement, in a detached room, in a garage, you're, you will need to consider the issue of temperature climate control. In the theater, depending on where you have it, if you do have temperature control, that's great. If you don't, you may run into issues of watching a movie in the summer where it gets hot, the heat is contained in the room, and you don't want to run fans because it's going to make it loud. Unless it's a quiet ceiling fan, that might work. So temperature control is another thing you may need to consider depending on your setup. There are two more topics I want to cover in this video. One of them is media content. So most people will, will have a network system similar to this where you have cable coming to your home and the cable connects to a wireless router that either sends a signal wirelessly to your devices or wired to your devices. At best, currently in 2014, the highest quality of internet that you can have is measured by megabytes per second and it can be about 50 to 60 megabytes per second and that's without any optical cabling enhancement or anything like that. 
The reason I want you to understand this is because you have now invested enough time, enough money into a home theater system, and you want to understand what kind of image, what kind of quality you will be watching through your system. Compression, compression, compression. So this is the main issue when you're talking about quality of what you're watching in your home theater. So imagine ten, water is 1080p. Now just go with me on this. Water is 1080p. So if you compress water a lot, you make it into a small stream. And yeah, water's 1080p. You're getting 1080p quality, but it's in a very small stream. Are you still getting wet? Yeah, it's hot outside. You have the sprinkler on. You're going to get wet. You're going to get 1080p quality. However, if you don't compress it as much, least compression, then you're going to get more water coming out of that hose. Now imagine firemen here and this little girl here getting soaked. So on the left here, you're still getting a stream of water. You're still getting 1080p, but it's in a very uh, small, very weak format. On the right, you have the least compressed, which will be a very, very strong signal filled with a lot of high definition, high color, high sound. You just get more out of it. You get the point. So let's go through these one by one. So Blu-ray is the least compressed of all media. So when you put in that Blu-ray uh, DVD, the Blu-ray disc into your Blu-ray player, you're going to get a signal coming at you at 50 megabytes per second. And this is currently the most signal you can get, the least compressed, the fireman hose quality of content. So that means you're going to get a lot of color, a lot of sound coming at you in a very strong signal at 50 megabytes per second. Now comparing that to streaming, streaming, whether you're watching it through Apple TV or any other device, at best the highest quality currently of streaming is about 5 megabytes per second. So you can tell now the difference that when you're watching a Blu-ray it's 10 times less compressed than streaming. However, sometimes I'm watching streaming through Netflix, through Apple TV, and I have a hard time telling the difference. So even though it's 10 times more compressed through streaming, you're still going to get a good quality. And think about the convenience. When you're streaming, you don't have to get up, change the Blu-ray disc, etc. Now next, and this might be a dying breed as well, it's the HD DVD, high definition DVD, not just the regular DVDs. So the high definition DVDs are coming at you at 36 megabytes per second, just so you know the difference there. And HD TV broadcasting, that's coming at you at about 19.3 megabytes per second. So there you have it guys, now you know the difference of quality that you're getting through different sources of media. And I choose to watch streaming more than anything because it's convenient and the quality through streaming is very good. However, if I want really really like a movie and I want to purchase it, I will purchase that movie on Blu-ray if I want to watch it over in a different time because I know that that's going to give me the highest quality to enjoy that movie at its fullest. The last topic I want to talk about is acoustic treatment to your room. Now, before we go into how to place the panels, let's talk about the different types of panels. There is absorption panels, and these types of panels can look different. However, the main function is to absorb sound and not release it. The next panel is diffusion panels, and there are two types of diffusion panels. There's 3D diffusion panels in which sound hits the panel and it bounces off in many directions. And then there's 2D dispersion panels in which sound hits the panel and it goes off in two directions. Also, there are corner bass traps, and these will sit in the corners of your room to trap that bass that can linger in that space. One of my other most favorite items that I purchased for my home theater that made the biggest difference in sound is the gig and recording amp and monitor modulation attenuator. They call it the grandma at RLX for short. And so what happens is you sit your bass on top of this and it will clean up the bass. Now a lot of people say that, clean up the bass. I never understood what that meant until I bought it and I put my bass, my subwoofer on this. And I realized it, when watching Jurassic Park, for example, when I didn't have this, the bass would rattle my cabinets. After I put my subwoofer on this, it will rattle me and not the cabinets. So it really helps concentrate the bass coming out of your subwoofer into the room instead of into the walls of your room. I really don't know how this works, but I found this to be the best 
item that I purchase when trying to enhance my quality of sound. So the acoustics recipe that I have here comes from the Home Theater Geeks on YouTube. And so think of it this way, 100% of the surface area of your room, including the ceiling, the floor, and the four walls, 20% of it has to be covered in absorption surface panels, absorption panels, and 25% has to be diffusion surface. Now the 2D and the 3D will get into more detail. However, in total, your entire surface area, you don't want to have more than 50% of the room with paneling. So you want to have 45% the way we talked about, 20% absorption and 25% diffusion. And the way to lay these out in the room is going to be to put, layer them out, stagger them. Put one absorption, one diffusion, one absorption, one diffusion throughout your entire room. And in the front, you want to put the 2D dif dis uh, diffusion panels. And in the back, you want to put the 3D diffusion panels. So this recipe is going to be key if you want to have that ultimate sound experience. Now, you will probably have good sound experience regardless of the acoustics recipe, but if you're noticing that your room has a little bit of an echo or has a rebound noise, you may need to consider applying this recipe to your room. So there you have it, guys. This is a rundown of what I consider to be the issues you need to consider when you're making and when you're enhancing a home theater from the components, the location, the wiring, the connections, the different luxuries that you might want to have in your home theater, ways to think about designing, decorating your theater. These are all things I wish I would have known ahead of time before I got into this project. My finished theater, the tour, is up next, so make sure to watch my next video where I focus mostly on giving you a tour of my home theater.